we'll start over and involve you and others in some of, some of the ways that you just described in your statement. So thank you for being here. Thank you. Just real, real quick for everybody, we've got about 40 people who want to ask questions and not a lot of time left. So let's, uh, I think we will have to reduce the, the question time down a little bit and keep them a little short. Go over here. I'm Judy McKenna. I'm a retired uh, uh, professor from Colorado State. I'm interested in the um, decision that the Supreme Court will make about the health care yes. uh, bill. Yeah. First of all, I want to know, can they actually uh, say the entire bill is unconstitutional? Secondly, I'd like to know if they focus on the individual mandate and decide that that is unconstitutional, what will the impact be on the healthcare system in the United States? On your first question, I'm not an attorney. Uh, I'm surrounded by attorneys. My wife's an attorney. Uh, but what I understand, but I have learned a lot about the law uh, in the process of being a legislator. And it's, it's been said often that the law is uh, not fair. It's not just, it's not even commonsensical. It's just the law. Uh, now, I know there are attorneys here who would uh, uh, make a compelling case for the work it's done to, to, to see that it's applied in a just way, in a fair way, in a commonsense way. But the Supreme Court, as the ultimate arbiter, has a pretty wide field uh, on which they play. I do believe most of the cases that have been directed uh, to them are focused on the individual mandate. And there is a concept called stare decisis, which is set law is settled. Uh, the Supreme Court shouldn't reach outside uh, that concept, that, that set of concepts. Uh, but the Citizens United case is an example of where 100 years of law was overturned. With that, I think they will focus on the, on the individual mandate. Now, I would add that the, there have been a number of courts who considered this appellate courts as well as district courts. And there have been a mixed set, set of results that both conservative and uh, more liberal judges, at least based on their writings and the subject to the, uh, analysis of their uh, particular philosophies, have both agreed that the individual mandate is constitutional. There are a couple of other courts that have not. So I, I, yeah, I think that's what the focus would be. Um, it's fascinating to me that the individual mandate is a concept that was generated in conservative and progressive think tanks alike. And the whole concept is personal responsibility. Uh, Governor Romney pushed this idea very strongly in the state of Massachusetts, where the law there is working quite well. Uh, and I would, uh, to your second question, believe that there are ways in which the law can continue to be applied uh, and will continue to work uh, to meet that three-part goal, which is full access, uh, quality, and affordability. That's what we really all want in our healthcare system. And this, the path we were on, and some of us still are on, is unsustainable. Our healthcare costs are increasing 70% a year. That's twice any other developed country. There's a phenomenal book uh, entitled The Healing of uh, America by T.R. Reid. He's a journalist. Uh, the Washington Post for years. He lives in Denver now. He had, he had a bum shoulder, I think he still does, from a football injury. He traveled the world, uh, participated in many of the world's healthcare systems. It's a wonderful read. It gives you a sense of the challenge we face in America, but also the benefits our system provides. Really, we have four or five healthcare systems we're trying to integrate. We have a single payer, it's called Medicare. We have uh, nationalized medicine, socialized medicine, somewhere else, it's called the VA. Uh, we have a fee-for-service uh, system. We have a private insurance system. And they all have a role. They all have uh, been important uh, parts of our healthcare delivery process. But integrating all those is a real challenge. But, but there are ways in some to work. If the Supreme Court overturn the individual mandate, there are a lot of ways to work around it, including the state exchanges, which we've set up here, which will provide competitive pricing and packages for small businesses, individuals, and families, which is, after all, where the real uh, nub has been. Those three groups, those three sectors, the healthcare market, are the least well served and pay the highest premiums. And that was really the focus of the healthcare efforts in the Congress.
options for, for people who fit into those categories. But uh, we, we're going to, uh, as a strong support of the health care, affordable health care act, I'm going to continue to look for ways to do those three things I said. Affordability, maintain our quality, and increase access so ultimately all Americans have health care. And as a member of the Armed Services Committee, uh, this is a national security issue. You can't have a strong country if you don't have a healthy population. Thanks for everyone. Good morning, Senator. I want to thank you very much for this opportunity to ask some questions. Sure. And uh, my name is Claire Faro. I'm a peace activist. I moved here within the past year. And every day I think about the lives and money that could have been saved if my senators in New York had listened to us and not gone to war in Iraq. So my question is simple. What are you doing personally to keep us out of war with Iran? Mm -hmm. My organization, Strength Through Peace, is very concerned about the rising rhetoric. Yes. And so that thank, you. Yeah. Well, thank you for
so you had quite concerns about the National Defense and Orientation Act. You nevertheless voted for it. I have two sons in the military, and I really don't want to see them acting against American citizens. So what I would like to know is what you will do in the future to stop erosion of our liberty and freedom. Yes. I missed your name, sir. Uh, Peter Hochheimer. I don't know if Tony likes it, but I'm also an American uh, uh, retired professor and chair of the Assembly. Uh, my name is Peter Hochheimer. I'm a retired professor and a chair here at CSU. How about if I call you professor? <laughs> Can I do that? Thank, thank you for your, I'd love to meet your sons one day, by the way. They're both serving, uh, yeah. as you mentioned. Yeah, my son uh, has one you're put to Iraq, and now my other son has to go to Afghanistan. Yes. Um, you, you're uh, alluding to the National Defense Authorization yes. Act, the NDAA, which had uh, some objectionable provisions included. I fought against those provisions, but I hope you know on the yeah, I know, set, but you voted for, for a number of weeks. In the end, he said, I voted, voted for, the for bill, it anyway. Uh, with serious and, and, and grave reservations. There were so many important elements in the bill that I felt needed to move forward, including uh, additional policies to help the military become more energy. Uh, self-reliant. The military, by the way, is leading in many of these new energy technologies because they understand the price of being dependent on foreign oil. There are a set of policies that apply to your children and how we compensate uh, and them for their service. Uh, there were provisions um, that were focused on the kind of hardware that we're going to buy uh, protect our country. So there were there were many, many important provisions in a, in a very significantly sized bill. Having said that, that was a tough pill for me to swallow because of these detainee provisions, which overreach and which were opposed by the director of the FBI, the Secretary of Defense, the Attorney General, uh, and the White House, at least initially. What I'm going to do is work with Senator Feinstein and others to, number one, keep an eye on how these provisions are implemented. And then number two, we've introduced another piece of legislation and we're going to work to bring to the floor of the Senate that would trim back what was put in place. Uh, but I appreciate your attention to this. Uh, I uh, thank all of you who supported me in what was a pretty lonely fight. I started out in the uh, Armed Services Committee as one no vote, 26 yes votes and one no vote in the committee last summer. And uh, I was, though, inspired by uh, the input that you all have given me and my concern that we always are tempted in the interest of security to limit our civil liberties. And we always find that that was the wrong course of action. In the Second World War, we interned Japanese Americans in our own state here. That was the wrong thing to do and it didn't strengthen us. Uh, during the First World War and the aftermath of the First World War, we implemented the so-called Palmer Raids Home rates were searching for communists and other uh, Americans who some thought were hell bent on overturning our government and acting in traitorous fashions. In fact, they fashion, in fact, they were just voicing their their point of view. Even Lincoln suspended the writ of habeas corpus uh, during the Civil War. All of those were seen as mistakes. I hope I'm wrong. Uh, I hope this isn't seen as a mistake. Uh, but I'm always mindful of what. Um, Ben Franklin put so powerfully, he said, a society that would set aside essential liberties for temporary security deserves neither. And uh, our Bill of Rights is the biggest, baddest weapon we have. That's why we're admired. We need to believe in it. We need to support it. We need to stand by it. At the heart of that is this concept of habeas corpus, which is you can't jail anybody without uh, cause and without due process. This one provision yeah. could allow Americans to be detained indefinitely on the basis of what the President of the United States believes. And we all know this President wouldn't do that, and we know the previous Presidents wouldn't do that, but power can corrupt, and we see it over and over again in human affairs. So thank you for keeping me on the spot, and I look forward to working with you. Thank you. Pete, you got up. How are you, sir? Hi, my name is Monty Barry, and uh, I'm working for broadcasting for over 30 years at the Anson 
If you, uh, if this law, if this new law were taken to an extreme, uh, that's possibly an outcome. Which is why we have to be vigilant. It's why we need you to speak out. It's why we all need to speak out. It's why we have to protect the first amendment. Sure. And if you're talking about due process for U.S. citizens, why are we allowing the president to run for This is the last question we'll take. After that, we're going to go back to Mike's. Just so you guys know, okay. Okay. make sure everybody gets an opportunity, for, especially for those who already ask questions. Yeah, John, John what, I'll follow up with you on that. Yeah. 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 These are all really important questions. You got some? Yeah. Hi, I'm Lynn Hull. Hi. I want to tell everybody that I really appreciate all of these questions. I think they're important things to consider. However, we haven't talked a whole lot about the sea monster in the room, which is our collapsing planet. And I've been informed recently by pretty credible sources, uh, scientists, etc., that if we were to ramp up at the rate that we ramped up for wars or for the space shuttle, with 2% of our gross national product, in 10 years we could be off of oil and gas and coal onto alternative energy. Mm -hmm. Considering how many of the points we've talked about today are generated by our dependence on coal natural gas and oil. Why aren't we doing that? There's, there's so much more to do. I think you know that um, if, you, if you don't, um, I'm going to speak to it right now, but I focus um, a lot of my time and energy on alternative energy, energy efficiency technologies. And, and I do so for three reasons. One is the central purpose of this town meeting, which is to focus on job creation and strong economy. There's enormous potential here. The Chinese and the Indians and the Germans and the Danes and the Spaniards are not investing in these technologies. Just to feel good, they're investing in these technologies because they see the markets that are opening up. They see the, the uh, pressures of uh, climate change and carbon emissions uh, on an unprecedented scale changing our, our climate. Uh, and they also, in the process, understand that their national uh, security concerns, uh, if you have a significant climate shift, you're going to disrupt the way in which humans live, which will create chaos, which will create tension, which then results in, uh, in violence. Uh, and then finally, the environmental benefits are uh, very, very important as well. So I, I'm going to continue to do everything I can from promoting a renewable electricity standard nationally. You know, we have one here in Colorado, and again, not, not to be immodest, but when I was elected to the legislature in 1996 and served one term in 1997, one of my five bills, we're going to have five bills in the legislature, so you think really carefully about what you introduce, because you're going to have to hear one of my five bills was a renewable electricity standard. Nobody even knew what I was talking about back in 1997. I, I was thumped, I was shellacked in the legislature, um, but I kept at it. And in the end, Wallace Bradley, the Republican Speaker of our State House, who was very interested in this and saw the economic development potential, uh, she, uh, we worked together uh, to bring Amendment 37 to the ballot. Some of you remember Amendment 37. Was the first, we were the first state to use the referendum, the initiative process, to pass a policy. Since then, we've taken off. We now have the second highest renewable electricity standard, 30 uh, percent. Uh, California's, I think, is 31 and a half or 32 percent. And we're well on the way to meeting that goal and all of the attendant benefits <coughs> that are generated. Um, having said that, so it's because I, I, I owe you uh, an honest answer, I, I, owe you, I need to honor you with, uh, with honesty. We are still dependent on coal and oil, nuclear, uh, because of the demands of our society. I could stand here and tell you that tomorrow we're going to fully convert to these new technologies. But over the next generation, we will. The writing is on the wall. The progressive utilities are embracing these new technologies. We're finding new cost structures that reward people who use less energy rather than more. The existing cost structure says so the more energy you use, the lower your prices. Well, less energy you use, the lower your price out So there are a lot of very important policy prescriptions that we can push at the federal level. And I, I would welcome your your interest on my website and, and all the various energy proposals that I put forth.
but that's this is the future for all the reasons I outlined: job creation, national security, and environmental benefit. <coughs> Thank you, Senator Udall, for this opportunity. My name is Linda Hannock. I'm from Estes Park, Colorado, and I greatly revere the natural resources that we have here in our state. My background is very. I'm a teacher. I am a successful business owner, and now my daughter and I have started another business to enhance Northern Colorado's economy. Fantastic. One more thing that is very important to me now, and that is part of our natural resources in Colorado. <clears throat> I know, I believe you still sit on the Natural Resource Committee, is I that do, right? yes. Uh -huh. um, I am also one of about tens of thousands of wild horse advocates in the United States who question the fiscal responsibility of spending 75 to $100 million a year to round up horses according to an antiquated, outdated system of our wild horse management. We have fewer wild horses today than any time in history. We would love to come to a meeting of minds with the Bureau of Land Management, with the management that's going on now. There are several of us, actually Colorado has the largest wild horse advocacy groups in the country now. We have one here in Fort Collins called Colorado Wild Horse and Borough Partners. We meet with the state office, we meet with the regional offices. I've met with the Wyoming office, yes. the Montana office. We are working very hard to have a, a coming together to work on this fiscal problem. And we really feel it is a fiscal problem first. Um, what can you do to help this happen? Mm -hmm. I remember uh, the wonderful documentary that. Uh, John Denver did, and I guess I show how old I am because it's occasionally on public television. He's, he, there's a scene where he's in the Red Desert in Wyoming, which is in the western part of Wyoming, and uh, he's uh, concealed himself uh, to watch and observe wild horses. And he gets very excited uh, because he says, when we see wild creatures as humans, we are reminded of what it's like to be free. And given that that's a quintessential American value, that's something that I think we all uh, can remember and, and benefit from. That's why I think many of us in this room, and particularly Westerns, are such advocates of protecting wildlife. Uh, because if wildlife are healthy, we're going to be healthy. We're all intertwined. On the wild horse policy that you outlined, it's, uh, it's controversial. I don't have to tell you that. And it is, uh, some days, affected by the resources and the resource shortfalls. I don't have a killer prescription here as to what we ought to do, but I welcome your your thoughts and ideas on what sort of direction we ought to go agencies. There is a, there is a balance, um, and uh, horses are in competition with sheep, big uh, wild sheep, with antelope, uh, depending on the area that they're in. You, 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 I'm sure, have much more of a working knowledge of all the particulars and details, but we, we want to, in, in the right and balanced way, to protect those wild horse herds. And I would welcome your thoughts on, on, the, on the ways that we do that. You're from Estes, too, by the way. I know, I know, I want to state a comment. I know there's a transmission line that's been proposed up there, and it's gathered some attention. And my understanding is that this is the beginning of a long process. The Western Area Power Administration, WAPA, is the acronym. Uh, it's required to undertake a comprehensive process. So. Don't believe that it's a given uh, that the, the uh, line will be built in the way that's been initially proposed. Those of you who care about this, get involved with make your voices heard, uh, be engaged. I'm going to continue to monitor as it moves forward. Senator, we have enough time for one last question. Maybe, maybe two. Time huh? now. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, um, my know. name is Nancy York. I'm a native of Fort Collins. And thank you so much for having this forum where people sure. can give their input. And saying that, I would also appreciate your expanding on ways that we, the public, can be most effective in, get, in influencing you, uh, given that we don't have, many of us don't have much money. But that said, I just want to read my priorities. Okay. Uh, many that have been spoken here. Good. Global warming, 
Yes. Affects everyone. Um, stretch in the uh, U.S. military expansion and favoring diplomacy, mm -hmm. strengthening our democracy uh, with the constitutional amendment to say corporations are not persons and money is not speech, and maintaining the open, in, open and free internet. Uh, Medicare for all, including Congress, and uh, renewable energy, yeah. and public transportation uh, and trains. And uh, thanks again, and a, I'd like to hear your response. That's a great list. I mean, you've touched on a lot of those. Uh, on, on the Medicare Care for Congress, uh, once you turn 65, although there are waivers at, at earlier age, we're all in the we're all in the Medicare system, including members of Congress. One of the, my goals, and it continues to be a goal, I think we're closer to it, is that Americans ought to have the same choices that members of Congress and federal employees have. It's not just members of Congress, but it's the federal employee cohort. There are uh, over a million federal employees, and what we have is buying power, like a big corporation does, or a university does, or an institution has a significant number of employees. The Affordable Care Act was really directed at that, that, that concept. And I mentioned insurance exchanges. That's a way to pool the purchasing power of families, individuals, and small businesses to get better rates from the insurance marketplace. So that, that's, uh, that continues to be, as I mentioned earlier, uh, at the very top of my list because of their national security implications, their competitive uh, opportunities here when it comes to our economy. Many other countries who cover their citizens uh, are very competitive in the world uh, economy because their businesses know uh, what's going to be asked of them when it comes to providing health care to their employees. On the diplomacy, you're right. We need to be smart and tough, but we need to be first and foremost smart. And we usually need to use smart power. We, we've talked about some of the smart power principles here today, including the Bill of Rights. We need to close one time and obey. President Bush called for Guantanamo to be closed. President Obama's called for Guantanamo to be closed. There, there should be a way uh, to uh, bring those uh, prisoners, those detainees at Guantanamo to trial, put them through the process. But then let's close Guantanamo Bay. You mentioned climate change. It's astounding to me that the very community that's provided us with the highest standard of living in history. The very community that's provided us with, and John talked about this, uh, the flow of data that never could have been foreseen, or medical technologies that extend people's lives. Uh, jet airplanes have traveled 600 miles an hour. I mean, the list is long. That community, scientists, engineers, researchers, entrepreneurs, innovators, inventors, are telling us Physics and the laws of science are clear. If you emit carbon dioxide into our atmosphere, which is a contained envelope around this planet Earth that we're on, you will begin to add more heat to our climate systems, which will change the way in which our climate operates. That group is telling us we should do something about it, but we're too busy. But we don't want to hear it, so we ignore them. I'm not ignoring them. I see an enormous opportunity here, as I mentioned earlier, for a new kind of economy based on clean energy energy efficiency. I see our national security enhanced and protected. And of course, I see our environment uh, on which we all depend and maintain. Uh, the economy is a wholly owned subsidiary of our environment. And we need to remember that. And I, I say to people who suggest that controlling carbon emissions is uh, radical, uh, think about it. what's more radical. Let's just double the amount of carbon dioxide we're emitting and see what happens. But let's take all these common sense steps that will do what I just outlined in, in a policy of no regrets. If somehow all of these scientists are wrong and we were still to implement the set of policies that would respond, the increase in carbon emissions, we'd be the much better for it. I think we ought to pursue that kind of no regrets policy and 
It's uh, one of the real central focuses of my service in the Senate. We're going to keep at it. Uh, the forces of denial will fall short eventually, but we have we have real work to do. I need your help. I need the help of the scientific community, the business community. As you know, many many businesses are on board, including many of the utilities. I understand that what they're doing has an effect, and they they want policies that point us in this new direction. And, uh, I'm, I'm uh, in the end optimistic that we're going to get it right. But the clock is running. I don't have to tell you all that. We're seeing the changes. Uh, and I know one winner doesn't make a difference. I, say, I should say one winner isn't uh, indicative. Of one weather cycle isn't indicative of change. But it's all beginning to add up, isn't it? And you talk to farmers. You talk to people who make a living off the land. You talk to scientists. You talk to the Antarctic researchers. Uh, this is underway. It's time for us to act. Can I? Can we do one more, Pam? No. No. no, no. no. Okay. Well, and I'm sorry. And I, that was a great wrap-up. That's a great wrap-up. And, and I think Tom has a couple of minutes. Yeah, Thank you all for being here. Uh,